<clears throat> so welcome everybody uh, to our coaching conversation series with Matthew Soccer. I'm excited tonight to be joined by Carl Spratt, who's the New England Revolution Academy goalkeeper coach, or director, sorry. Um, so the way this is going to work is uh, Carl is going to run through a presentation, giving some ideas of how to keep goalkeepers active and engaged. Uh, we've got a selection of questions that were sent in ahead of the webinar, which we will go through, and then we'll go to general Q&A uh, from the chat box. So if you have questions as you go along, please put them into the chat box. We can uh, always stop if there's something that's relevant to that very moment um, and ask the question as we go along, but otherwise we'll attend to all questions at the end. So thank you for being here, and I'll hand over to Carl now. Well, thanks, uh, coaches. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate uh, Matthew Soccer and the guys for, for putting this uh, platform on. Um, just before we get going, <clears throat> I think it's, it's really important to continue among the theme and that I've seen, especially with goalkeeper coaches and goalkeeper educators, that um, people are starting to share in these times. Uh, the information that I'm going to talk about tonight is uh, by no means uh, the Carl Spratt Show. It's 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 activities and projects that we've been doing with our, within our goalkeepers, within our players that we found beneficial. And uh, just like I am doing, I wanted to make sure that I was providing a resource to share. And uh, certainly, as we go along, feel free to ask questions and and have comments. So um, just to go through a little bit of an agenda that we'll go through tonight. Um, how this kind of discussion topic materialized? Obviously, us being away from the field. Um, and we still have elite level athletes and athletes that we want to tend to. Um, again, um, sharing the information and, and it's been it's gotten out there. And I think just when when I was approached to do this, um, this was the first thing that came to mind. A lot of people now you'll see are doing kind of technical stuff with their players, which is great. And we went in a little bit of a different avenue, uh, understanding a strategy of how long we were going to be away from the field and what would be most beneficial. Um, obviously, what were our targeted outcomes when doing these type of projects and initiatives? Um, how do we encourage and maintain demands of the players? I'm um, going to give you guys an outline of the projects that we've done over the last six weeks um, and what were, what were and what have been our findings throughout this time. So it's understanding to say when you're dealing with, uh, with youth athletes, it's a process. Um, this is an image that we use at our player orientation every year, and I think it's, it's even more appropriate uh, in the current days. And the top half is what the players think there when they first start kicking a ball and, and they're going to go on to be professional athletes. That's what they think the process looks like. The bottom image is the reality for us as coaches and parents, what it ends up being. Everything that we do kind of revolves around our uh, development mission. Obviously, as you can see there, just highlighted to execute and adapt um, a long-term approach uh, for elite level uh, youth soccer. And then obviously to provide age appropriate and performance environments that will help develop the tools needed for them to succeed as they go along the pathway. When we talk about our players, we, and I really believe in this, that we categorize it into three separate parts. First part is building the person. Then that you start talking about developing and, and growing the confidence of the person. Igniting the passion, passion for the game, the passion for the position, which is goalkeeping. Encouraging those players to be responsible in their actions. Developing some form of resilience, even more appropriate now um, when things aren't quite linear. Um, the resilience of the athlete, of the goalkeeper is really, really important and a special characteristic to have. And then looking to, to develop and grow on the personality. The personality that we've seen through our kind of scouting process, um, the personality that makes that player a little different, we want to kind of continue to build and grow upon that. The size of the person, now we look to develop and build the player. Obviously, we want the player to have a good technical foundation. We want them to be intelligent, okay? We want them to make autonomous decisions. Um, throughout our process, we, we make it real clear to both the parents and the players that we're not going to spoon feed players. We're not going to give them all the answers. We want them to make an autonomous, autonomous um, organic decisions, and I think that's a really important trait to have. Obviously, the athletic component separates them. It could be a separating factor when we talk about goalkeepers. And again, common denominator here through the player, we want them to be resilient. And then finally, the competitor. The competitor has to be resourceful, we feel. It has to be self-aware of not only their surroundings, but of their performance and the level and the players that they're playing with and creating the connections. They have to be courageous. Okay, They have to be willing to take risks and put themselves out there. 
when it comes to competition, you have to be ruthless. There's organic moments that appear, and we encourage our goalkeepers, just like our field players, to be ruthless throughout the process and take advantage of these moments. And again, common denominator is resilience. And I think resiliency is one that when we talk about um, the DNA of our player, uh, resiliency is high on our list. And it's something that, again, no matter what they're faced with, no matter what obstacles or hurdles they have to overcome, I think if you approach it with a little bit of resiliency and start building that from the person, the player, and into the competitor, I think it's a, a really important trait for anybody to have, not just athletes. So when we talked about this, we were we were real strategic <clears throat> when we um, when we sat down when this uh, time away from the field first got going. Um, myself and the rest of the coaches had an open discussion with our goalkeepers, and we we identified that. The reality was we were going to be away from the field a little longer than what we'd all hoped. So we wanted to make sure that we, we categorized and make sure there was targeted outcomes, just like we're providing an elite level pathway for our players. And this doesn't have to be, and you'll hear me reference the elite level pathway, because obviously that's the, the level of players within an MLS academy that I'm working with. But this is transcendent across all age groups, all abilities. Um, identifying outcomes is really important. I think one of those main and key outcomes, just like you do when you're coaching on the field, um, we want to instill and encourage the passion for the position. Obviously, we're talking in relative to goalkeepers here, um, but coaches, I think that's one of the things that uh, we strive for the most. You can be the most technically profound gift coach in the world, but if you can't create that environment for the players that, to want to succeed, you can't create that environment that uh, they continue to instill and encourage the passion for what they're doing, all of that tactical and technical knowledge becomes null and void because the player is not going to want to do it. So away from the field, just like we would on to, we want to make sure that we instill and encourage passion for the position. We wanted to develop and strengthen emotional resiliency, understanding that they're going to be put into environments and situations away from their friends, away from their teammates, that really and throughout their lives they've never been placed in. We wanted to make sure that understanding the player, understanding the person more though, uh, through the projects and resources that we we're going to give these players uh, would allow them to continue their development and strengthening their emotional resiliency. Improving their levels of self-awareness, a trait that we talked about in one of the three characteristics earlier. Um, but again, just like we talk about on the field, <clears throat> you have to look within first, understand what you could have done, how you could have improved, you know, what the result was of, out of your actions before you start casting aspersions and looking at anyone else. Same way away from the field, but making sure that all of our players continue to develop self-awareness and improve on that aspect of their game was a really important part. And then finally, we just wanted to empower the players. Just like we talked about, there's organic moments that happen every day, every environment that we do. And we wanted to empower their autonomous behavior. So I think from us going through the projects that we strategically put together as a goalkeeper department, working with our players, we wanted to make sure that we had clear identified targeted outcomes and then figuring that we can get creative throughout the, throughout the time away from the field to make sure that we instill on them. Rob, just, just to kind of go from, I don't, I don't want to talk for too long. Does anybody kind of have any questions or, or comments based on any of the, the information that I've presented so far? Nothing in the chat box at the moment, Carl. Uh, but okay. if you do have questions, please um, pop them in there. Um, as we go along, we've got some that are coming up now. Okay, certainly. Just ask whether the PowerPoint and video would be uh, shared. What's the best way to involve parents in these outcomes? The best way to Mike. involve parents is, is just communication, right? And I know as coaches, when you know, I deal with you know, any from goalkeepers from kind of 14s all the way up, and and that's goalkeepers, right? So it's naturally a, a, a smaller targeted demographic of players. But if you're a head coach, and I think the 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 call to parents during this time you know just inquiring about how that person is doing i'll use an example my my three-year-old son uh, does a, a swimming class and it's he's three-year-old but we had a we had a phone call on sunday and a couple of our neighbors have got the same call and the, and the, the people who own the swimming company had just reached out just not not really talking about when we're going to get back in the pool it was just really how how my son was doing how's he doing being away from daycare is he missing his friends and, and that goes a long way and and all of a sudden, they, they knew his name, they knew his, they knew his sister's name. So I think from a, from a parental involvement point, the coaches out there, you know, you have, you have ways to communicate with parents and understanding that everyone really is in, a, in the same boat, i.e. being away from the field. 
I think going a long way to understanding the, the family situation, how the, how the child, how the player is doing away from the field, uh, will go a long way to, you know, getting that feedback. And then if you do look to put together some projects like, like we've done, uh, you have a little bit of foundational knowledge applied. Excellent. Uh, question from Alka. How and if so, is this plan different from players other than goalkeepers? I'm assuming he's relating to the um, outcomes and the goals for goalkeepers as opposed to field players in the Revolution Academy. Yeah, um, well, this what I'm presenting tonight, Coach, is, uh, is specifically for the goalkeepers, what I've done for the goalkeepers, but you'll be able to see as we go through the projects, they are easily manipulated for the field players too. Um, We'll, we'll go through and we'll, we'll talk about the kind of main area of focus, not being the technical and more on, you know, getting to know the, the person um, through the game, through, through an avenue of the game. Um, but our, our head coaches um, have put together various other little projects by positional group, um, and that's how we've communicated with those. But the, the information tonight is specifically for goalkeepers, but, you know, it's goalkeepers because I'm the goalkeeper director and I'm working with those guys. They can be easily manipulated uh, for for mass player groups or just individual positional groups too. Absolutely, and uh, Alka and everyone else on the call. Uh, this is part of a series that we've arranged with the Revolution. So in two weeks' time, we have Brian Scales, um, who is, is he technical director for the academy, and then uh, two weeks following that, we have Kurt Anolfo, who is the first team or overall technical director for the New England Revolution. Uh, so it would be pretty cool to see the connection and pathway. Yeah, Brad Brian is the, the Director of Youth Development of the of the Academy. So he oversees all of our uh, youth team and, and training and strategy kind of orientation. And then, as you said, Kurt is the, the Technical Director of the club. So two guys with a, with a vast amount of knowledge. Great stuff. All right, <coughs> let's jump back into it and we'll uh, address some questions a little later. Sounds good. So project one um, kind of highlighted this goalkeepers past and present. And, and I think, you know, trying to ignite the position or the passion for the position, as I talked about earlier, um, the way that we started off with is I, I, I kind of tasked the players to pick a goalkeeper uh, that's currently playing in, in world football um, that they admire the most. Now, from that, I asked them to identify three technical strengths of that goalkeeper. I also then to, to describe and analyze their playing personality and presence. Okay. Did they have any key distinguishable factors within the position, within the psyche of the position that made them a little different in kind of compassing with their technical strengths? So one, they had a good idea of the technical abilities from a strength point of view and the way that their personality and presence has allowed them to be successful through world football today. I then wanted to kind of have them under, understand and appreciate the history of the game too. So I, I tasked them to go back and, and find a goalkeeper, a former professional goalkeeper who's no longer playing that has similar traits, similar technical abilities, similar traits from a personality and presence standpoint um, of, the, of the ones that they've identified. So it's forced the goalkeepers. I think my, I'm really fortunate that my guys like kind of looking at and appreciate the history of the game, but it forced them to, to kind of delve a little deeper and do a little bit of research. And then from that, they have the technical strengths and personalities and presence that they admire in the current goalkeeper. They've had a chance to re uh, research and study a goalkeeper that's no longer playing um, and then I also wanted to identify similar traits that they've seen in other goalkeepers that relates to their own playing style. And I think what, what that allows me as a goalkeeper coach to do, it, it identifies things that they admire, okay, and hopefully look up to in current and former professional goalkeepers. And then without me have, asking them directly, they've started to kind of give me, and, and, what I, and you see this through my, my teaching, but they've started to give me what they want to be as a goalkeeper too. So all of a sudden, they've started to identify their, goal, their own goalkeeper profile. Now, through all of these projects, at the end of each, uh, at the end of each kind of assignment, um, I do, I, I do the, my, my goalkeeper calls on a Sunday night. I have individual calls throughout the week, but I do a group goalkeeper call on a Sunday night, and that's when I give them their assignment. Uh, they have until the following Friday to hand it back into me, and I'm asking them to hand it back into me not because I don't trust them. I'm asking them to hand it back into me just because I would like to read through it before they now present that in front of their peer group on a Sunday night. Um, so that's the, the process that we go through. Um, so again, identifying and, and kind of similar traits to their own. The final little bit of information that I give them, I give them two, two kind of phrases. I ask them to think outside the box 
and then be creative in terms of how they're going to present. Now, as coaches, when you ask and you ask a player to present the information, you're not quite too sure, you know, what platform they're going to use, whether it's just a simple Word document, whether they're just going to kind of verbalize it. Um, and not to my surprise, because I've got, you know, many different personalities within these goalkeepers, I came video clips, screen slides, um, PowerPoint presentations, um, the the magnitude of what they can do is is way beyond what I can do, right? And and that was the impressive thing that they're doing this stuff at school. Um, but just asking those guys to be creative and to think outside the box, I couldn't have been more pleased in terms of how they presented their findings. Um, and and they really kind of they've really taken to this. And again, I haven't really asked them to do anything technical yet. Um, just asking them to kind of go back a little past and present exercise, learn, appreciate the game, appreciate the history of the game but also igniting their passion and starting to identify really what they're telling me they would like to be as a player, which I think as a coach is really valuable information to have when you're teaching. Right. Um, question from Loy. Who were some of the goalkeepers that players related to the most? Yeah, so uh, Hugo Lloris was one of the goalkeepers that came out. Um, Peter Schmeichel was one of the goalkeepers that came out from past and present. Fabian Bartes was a goalkeeper that came out past and present. Uh, All Black was another goalkeeper who's currently playing. Uh, De Gea was a goalkeeper that was current, currently playing, and Buffon was the was the one. And I think all for many different reasons. And it was interesting to hear, Loy, that they talked about um, they talked about Schmeichel's presence and personality. They talked about Buffon's just commitment um, and what it takes to be a professional, not international level goalkeeper throughout the number of years that he's been doing it. They talked about uh, Fabian Bartes, how he had to overcome different objectives and hurdles that you know not many um, goalkeepers are able to overcome these days, being on the smaller side. So it was interesting to see them the, the areas that they kind of highlighted. Um, maybe some of our goalkeepers smaller in st stature, linked towards some of the goal some smaller goalkeepers, Bartes, Casillas, play goalkeepers like that, and then the more domineering Schmeichel, All Black, De Gea. Um, it was interesting to see how that, that goalkeeper profile translated to when they were doing their research. But really, uh, really broad spectrum. Um, and, and it was, again, just as a coach, you know, make, making sure that they can appreciate the history of the game and what goes into it, as well as relating it to the modern day, I think is a, is a really good exercise to do. So project two, uh, brain training. So I was really fortunate uh, this past summer to spend seven days in Germany with the, with the DFB and their international goalkeeping camp. Um, and one of, the, one of the main areas, not the main areas, but one of the, the main takeaways of importance that I got from that experience was the amount of work that they put into to developing the cognitive side of the goalkeeper. Um, so when it comes to brain training, simple explanation for the coaches, and you might be aware, but the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body, the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body, and then you also have a, a dominant eye and a less dominant eye too. So what they do is they place a huge amount of emphasis on cross-body activities, uh, making sure that you know not only are you using your dominant or less dominant eye, you're forcing the message to strengthen in the synapse. Obviously, that's the key to brain function, um, especially when it comes to memory. Um, so brain training, obviously, you know, together adds towards the retention, the memory, the visual learning, the visual acuity. Um, the sensory integration of what's around you. So as a goalkeeper, I think that's a really important uh, aspect to have. It helps with improving reaction times, um, can enhance and develop and, and help you guys move forward to a cardio training, um, but it all improves cognitive speed and decision-making. So knowing that one side of the brain controls the other side of the body, um, something that we've done within our academy, we've enco encompassed uh, brain training um, uh, se severely into our kind of uh, activation, our preparation stage of our session, and trying to link that directly to the movements that's going to be happening. So um, knowing that goalkeepers have a little bit of history on that, uh, what I wanted them to do, though, I wanted them to do some research, not just on the benefits of brain training from an athlete, but the benefits of it as a whole, and how, how can that help them in everyday life. I also wanted to make sure that not the benefits, but the purpose of why we do it, and why it could be beneficial to athletes, but then I wanted them to be creative. I wanted them, knowing that they had a, a foundation of, of knowledge from this, I wanted them to design three new brain training activities that we could now include um, into our uh, goalkeeper activation within the Revs Academy. So, um, again, like I just got a couple of little clips here. 
Um, just remember the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body and, and what we're looking to do is develop the, the synapse, the speed of that message going from one side to the other. So this is Brady. Brady's one of our U15 goalkeepers and you can see what he's doing just with simple balls. He's always cross body movements. The balls are staying still in terms of vertically um, and what he's doing is he's kind of activating his left side to catch the right side and vice versa. So real simple. This is a, a, a I've got many clips that I'm, I'm kind of more than happy to discuss and share. Um, another one uh, you can see from Brady just kind of including these in it. Um, again, one ball goes up, one ball goes under. The hands stay the same, but it's forcing the visual acuity of what he's doing is to control the right side of his brain is saying my left hand has to move here and vice versa. So just simple brain training activities. We do a number of activities similar to this as part of our activation before they even start their warm up. Um, but having the, having the goalkeepers, having be autonomous, being brave to think outside the box, adding slight variations to what we do. Um, I got 16 brand new kind of brain training activities that my goalkeepers have now designed. We will absolutely in, in, insert them into our curriculum, into our process and talk about empowering the goalkeeper when it comes to pregame and all of a sudden we're doing this and they're like, well, this is my activity. That's a really cool um, moment for the athletes to, to feel. So brain training project number two, nothing technical, um, but again, just forcing the goalkeepers to be creative. Anything come through, Rob? Just looking. Alka says this is great stuff. Um, do you want to show the uh, the participants what you did with me the other day? How you can find out which one your dominant eye is? I thought that was a, a pretty cool trick that they can use. Sure. Keepers. So again, I, I can I can't see everyone on the screen, so I just I, I trust that you're going to do it with me, so I'm not the only one here looking like a looking like a fool. But um, all right, so all I want you guys to do is just create like a diamond. Hold your hand out in front of you and create a diamond in your that you can see. Now identify a spot on your wall, a picture, a light switch, or whatever, and then just find that find that um, that spot through the diamond. Close one eye so you can see it with one eye, and then I want you to close the other eye and then see what happens to that spot you've been looking at. So everyone will see when you when you close one eye, you see it, and when you when you close it and open the other, it vanishes and it disappears. So the one that it disappears, that's your less dominant side. So the one that you can see it with is your dominant eye. The one that you can't and it vanishes, that's your less dominant side. So what happens now, as goalkeepers, I would do simple things, obviously developing this brain training, but when it comes to working on the dominant eye, the strengthening and, and of the, the less dominant side, I just kind of put a little eye patch on there and I still do movements like this. I might even just involve a real soccer ball, okay? But all of a sudden now I'm using my less dominant eye I'm working on the developing the right side to my left, my left side to my right, and it's the visual acuity in the brain training can be really, really important as a in life, not just in athletics, but as I said, you know, together it adds to, you know, all of the cognitive skills that that elite level athletes, goalkeepers, attention, memory, visual processing, uh, sensory integration, and thinking, all that goalkeepers need to do in split second moments. Um, but I thought this was a really, really cool project. And again, these guys recorded themselves. They just they 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 wrote session plans. I provided our goalkeeper session plan template of how they, this would integrate into a into an actual goalkeeper session. Um, but again, just empowering these guys to be creative and think outside the box. I was really pleased with uh, with the reaction and the response from the boys. We're going to test your science knowledge here a bit, Spratty. Does the dominant eye match the hand and the foot? No. No. Was that was that a trick question? Does someone know the answer, or, or were they generally known? Because no, it doesn't. Um, no, it doesn't. No, genuine question, I believe. No. Yeah. It it does not. No. So it's in it. But again, it's really. I mean, listen. You you see. You hear so many people who right left handed kick left handed, vice versa, right? So, um, the 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 dominant side is just that the peripherals is stronger, um, and I think that's where you see it when you, you identify that spot and then you vanish as it goes. Your head doesn't move. And you're looking through the same part, and if you make, even if you make the diamond a little bigger, the diamond shifts as well. So obviously the trick is to make the, t the diamond as small as you possibly can. But even if you think, well, okay, maybe it's just the size of the diamond that I'm looking through. You extend that, the diamond actually shifts when you make it bigger. So project three. Um, when we talk about athletes as coaches, um, I know this is this is huge when you go through the coach education kind of pathway. Is 
um, what type of questions are you asking your athletes, all right? Um, to define the answers and the level of understanding that they have. But as coaches, you get a real opportunity to, to give real-time feedback, and you get feedback in many different platforms. So understanding the importance of that feedback from the athlete is really, really important. But then understanding the, the importance of effective communication in the way that you give feedback can relate to coaches, but it also, from a goalkeeping standpoint, um, I'm a firm believer in you can't be a quiet goalkeeper. You can be a quiet person, but not a quiet goalkeeper. It's, it's just part of the, the job description. Um, but understanding you know, the importance of feedback, you can give feedback in real time on a game, big difference between shouting at someone and shouting to someone, um, but you've got to be precise to make sure that the effectiveness of your, of your words is, is impactful. So um, what I ask the guys to do, and again, this can be translated to any field player, a goalkeeper position. I ask them to assess uh, their age group competing goalkeeper, age group competing player. And the way I asked the system was identify three strengths of this player and then three areas of improvement. And I think the terminology in which we use is really important. We're dealing with young, aspiring professional athletes, um, young children. So when we talk about strengths, we don't never say weaknesses because to us there isn't. It's areas that they can improve on. So I think the terminology is really important uh, when you communicate, especially through projects like this. So I think that's easy as coaches. If you're doing your job well, you know the player's strengths and you know the areas that they need to improve on. Um, but from, a, from an athlete standpoint, okay, they've got to think a little bit deeper now. But doing this, I wanted them now to share their feedback in front of the group. So we have all of our goalkeepers on our call. Um, and now I would give Rob's feedback. Here, Rob, here's the three things you're really good at. And here's Rob's areas that are going to improve. Now, as a coach, as I said, I, I've got a pretty good handle on this. I know their strengths. I know their areas of improvement. What I'm looking for is when I'm saying this, what's Rob's body language? Is Rob uncomfortable? Is Rob getting defensive? Does he take this personally? Does he not really care what I think? And as the as the, the person giving the feedback, am I comfortable speaking? Am I comfortable sharing? Am I comfortable talking not only in front of you, but in front of the entire goalkeeper department? So I think this was a really important aspect, um, a project to do. Now, Couple of little wrinkles I threw in there. I actually had uh, Matt Turner, um, and uh, if those of you guys who don't know Matt, Matt's obviously our first team goalkeeper, and he's a, he's a national team goalkeeper as well. So Matt is at the pinnacle of his game. I actually had Matt jump on this call, um, unbeknownst to the players, because um, I wanted Matt and I wanted them to be able to speak uh, to Matt, all right, and about their teammates in front of Matt. But I, the reason I wanted Matt on this call um, was to have Matt share his way of receiving and kind of compartmentalizing feedback. Knowing that they're getting feedback from their age group goalkeeper, uh, Matt gets feedback from Coach Arena, Coach Hitchcock, his goalkeeper coach, the media, the press, social media, many different platforms. So the way that he comp compartmentalizes, and you can do this, uh, it doesn't have to be an athlete, you can do this with it be another coach, a teacher, a different parent, um, you know, a person in a, in a leadership role in business. I've seen these, I've seen similar things uh, done with, with different groups, different player pools. Um, I'm just really fortunate to have Matt on here. So I, I, I asked him to come on. He was more than willing. And, and having Matt share his feedback with the players was, was really empowering too. So uh, really good psycho kind of social uh, um, project I, I done with a group here. Again, nothing, te nothing technical. Um, be creative, think outside the box of how you share. And then by encouraging that, not only did I just have my goalkeepers saying, here's the three strengths, here's the three areas of improvement, I had them actually providing clips from games. Hey, Rob, such and such, this is what I think, maybe some crosses. Let me, I'm just got a couple of clips to show you. And not only were they given the feedback, they were given constructive feedback too. So all of a sudden now they've become mini coaches, which in turn, when I get back onto the field, the fact that they're coaching and working amongst themselves is ultimately what I want to get out of this, this environment um, and this experience for them. So that was project three. Anything come through, Robert? Good to be uh, going. Nothing come through, yeah. Jump on to the okay, next one. so, <clears throat> oh. all right. So uh, project four was split up into two parts. Um, Understanding that we have, you know, goalkeepers from U14 all the way up until our professional goalkeepers. Uh, I actually uh, set up a, a club goalkeeper call. 
Um, and again, I, I keep using the word goalkeeper, but for coaches who aren't goalkeeper coaches, this can be a club call, this can be an age group call, this can be po a positional call, um, whichever whichever avenue you wanted to go down. Just fortunate to have the goalkeeper. So you can see I've got uh, Brad, I've got Kevin Hitchcock, I've got Matt, um, I've got Jeff, I've got Joe, I've got all the guys from the from the academy on this call. Now, because they're because we're all goalkeepers and because we're all over the field, I didn't want the pros telling them, you know, about their journey or what they've done. You know, I I think you know from in this time, I wanted to to dig a little bit deeper. So I started talking about things like what have these guys been doing away from the field? Brad's a father. Jeff's just moved up here. You know, Matt's from New Jersey, but he's he's up here by himself. Like everyone's got different hurdles and different environments that they're in. So what have they been doing away from the field? You know, what have they struggled with? Showing a little bit of humility. The academy guys to the first team and first team down, I think was really important. What are, what's there been their key takeaways? One of the messages that I've always been given to the players is find your silver lining. And I said to Rob the other day that my silver lining, and I think his was the same, is that every family, every meal has been a family meal. I've been able to put my children to bed every night. If you asked me 10 weeks ago, how many nights are you gonna be able to put your, your son to bed? It would be zero, because I'm always away, I'm always training, I'm always traveling. But that's been my silver lining. So asking these guys, what have they learned? What's been their key takeaways? And what have they learned about themselves? And then really, what are they looking forward to the most? Just all non-soccer specific questions, but uh, just creating that connection, strengthening that connection from a positional side goes beyond just the X's and O's. So in, in, in encouraging these guys to, to kind of express and share their personalities, show a little humility. It's okay to show a little bit of weakness, okay? And all of a sudden I had guys taking the lead on this call, uh, Jeff speaking to guys, you know, just, hey, it's okay, man. We're, we're feeling the same way. Right? Because at the end of the day, that's what it is. You're a goalkeeper, you're a football, you're an athlete, you're at home, you can't do what you love doing. So I think just that kind of common denominator across the group was a really, uh, really powerful hour-long call. And I said that was that was the first part. Now, coaches, you'll see um, there's a there's a little, um, there's a, there's a kind of a project that the Athletic does these days where they get athletes to write a letter to themselves 10 years ago. So what I what I done was I asked these guys to kind of give, you know, based on that letter to themselves, uh, talk about what they feel that the top three traits for an elite level athlete uh, is, and then so all of a sudden some of the the characteristics just to provide some context were was hunger, uh, application, discipline. And this has come from the first team. I asked the first team guys to do this: emotional control and having an open mind. Um, you know, if you notice, there's nothing about being super athletic, being super fast, um, because everyone's got different athletic composition and different profile. But a lot of it has been about having a growth mindset, controlling what you can control, just being disciplined in terms of your approach, knowing that if the coaches give you to do something, make sure you apply yourself in the right, in the right way and just keep being hunger. Have that internal hunger, that internal drive to be the best that you can be. And I think that was something that was really important. So likewise, top three traits was on. I wanted these guys to talk about simple, some simple mistakes to avoid making. And again, for con context, not appreciating the family sacrifices that go on to get you to training. That was the one that a lot of the guys talked about. Trying to control too much, all right? Thinking that again, instead of looking in first, you're trying to control everyone else. And then sometimes by doing that, you're letting your own personal standards slip. Not appreciating other sports and the benefits of being multi-sport athletes can have on the development of an athlete. Okay, that was one that all of the goalkeepers referenced. Not focusing on the recovery, knowing that if the, if you have an off day, make sure you take an off day. Okay, because the importance of hydration, proper nutrition, um, implementing some form of stretching, um, and the recovery part of of trying to perform at the at your peak is is an unbelievable important part. And then just maybe trying to do too much too early, right? Two different teams, five nights a week, two games on Saturday, two games on Sunday, all of a sudden that burnout becomes very real. So it was interesting to hear the professional athletes talk about the traits from an elite level athlete, to provide context, and then some mis simple mistakes to avoid making. So again, it's a, it's a real powerful message. And ideally as coaches, you wanna be the one that says these things, but sometimes you've gotta go from outside your circle of trust in, and then that message is maybe just a little more powerful and resonates with the athletes. But that was the, the part two of, of the project. I'll keep moving on.
So project five was when we started to peel back the layers a little bit and see how the goalkeeper sees the game. Again, I haven't touched upon anything to do with technical yet, guys. I'm, I'm not trying to keep reiterating that point, but uh, I'll, I'll explain why. But it's, it's strategic. We've decided to go down this route, and we found it really beneficial. So project would be, would be video analysis. I sent those guys uh, three clips of a, some set pieces, um, three clips from three different levels of football. One would be World Cup, the highest level that you can be. Uh, the next would be MLS. And then another one would be a U17 World Cup, so to provide some context for players similar to an age group that I'm that I'm working with. And the way I decided to break this uh, goalkeeper set piece um, analysis down would be talking about the goalkeeper's presence and the personality, and the impact that can have on the moment. The techniques the goalkeeper used. Again, we're dealing with set pieces: catch, punch. Did he come? Did he not? Okay. Where did he punch? How many hands did he use? Talking about the tactics of a goalkeeper, high starting position, low starting position, nearest post, open stance, close stance, all these specific things. And then how the goalkeeper's techniques and the goalkeeper's tactics align with the team tactics. Was it a high line? Was it a deep line? Was it man to man? Was it zonal? Was it part zone? Having these goalkeepers to think about it. And this is something for the younger guys in our academy that we don't really do a lot of. Um, so, and, and something that with the older guys we, we do do a lot of, we empower those guys to provide, you know, context to the teams we're playing and, and styles. But having having all of the guys do this, um, again, be creative in terms of how you deliver your message. Think outside the box. Um, again, I had guys putting together presentations, schematics using the DCC uh, and the and the drawing tool that's on there. Um, a really really cool. Um, analysis part and then I had myself and some other coaches kind of peel back the layers a little bit and, and provide some context to what we what we wanted to see and then again another thing that when we go back onto the field another benefit that we feel um, it will have on on their overall performance <clears throat> so some uh, some key takeaways I think when we talk about it obviously we identified um, some goals that we wanted to receive. Um, some key takeaways, and let me just talk about the strategy of how, how this was pieced together. So, as I said, right at the start, we were you know, understanding that we were gonna be away from the field uh, a little longer than what we'd all hoped or even all imagined. So, um, we could have really easy, and we did give the guys like a, a workout plan to do, a, a generic club workout plan that all of our academy players went, and then I designed a specific goalkeeper workout plan. So they, and it's nothing to do with the ball. Um, and they do alternate days, club club workout, goalkeeper workout, club workout, goalkeeper workout. So that's that's something from a physical side, but that was just uh, something that we give these guys anyway. The projects, though, have, have been designed around um, the getting to know the person, okay? Getting to know the person, the, the playing side of the person. And I think if I'd have given these guys, here's some technical workouts for you to do week one, they would have been gung-ho. Week two, they would have been into it. They would have been looking for something new, feeling it now. Week three, all of a sudden, that motivation starts to drip. Week four, coach, what the heck are we doing this for? Our season's just being canceled. All of a sudden, as an athlete, we're trying to do this. Yeah, they've got their innate, their innate self-belief and drive that we want and we hope, sure. But if I'm the one feeding them this information as a coach, it's really hard for me to keep that kind of tension on the rope that as coaches, we always hope to have with players. So now I decided to be, it would be way more beneficial for me as a coach to use this time, to use this resource to get to know my guys in ways that I would never ever have time to do in the regular training, four nights a week, traveling for games, competing at a high level. So from a strategy standpoint, this is the way I decided to go down, rightly or wrongly. Um, I think my key takeaways though, that the relationship to the group has became stronger. No doubt about it. And I say as a group, it's the connection with us to the first team, the first team down, us to coaches, coaches to players, players to players. Uh, the dynamic of and the strength of that group has become, has become stronger. We've certainly learned new things about one another. A lot of this stuff is personal, but I, I shared some stuff with Rob, and I think he can say that some of the things that I, I talked about, I would never, ever know. I'd never get a chance to find out. I'd never get an opportunity to talk about. Um, but some, some real you know, personal things, which when I'm, when I'm teaching these athletes moving forward, will help me become a, a far more effective coach, understanding that if someone is behaving in a certain way, there might be a, something else going on, and now I maybe know what that is. You know, as a unit, we've improved our levels of trust, so I think we talk about the relationship has got stronger, but it can get stronger and there still not be the appropriate level of trust. 
And I think trust is one of the most important characteristics and to have relationship characteristics to have with your athlete. So I think the, the level of trust with one another um, has improved dramatically. These, these young players, their personalities have become more profound. Right? So we talked about the, the, the importance of you have to be a, a, a vocal, commanding goalkeeper, you can be a quiet person. But what this has allowed me to do is their off the field personality has become more profound. It doesn't have to be louder, but it's more, more profound, more confidence in, in what they do, um, in the way that they communicate, the way that they interact with, with me as coaches uh, and the rest of our coaching staff, um, but also them within the group as well. So the confidence and the personality has become more, fa more profound and as we feel has improved. Creativity has flourished. So just like on the field, we've asked these guys, we're not teaching robots, we want them to be creative. Um, just like on the field, you know, when I'm doing these presentations, be creative, think outside the box. And one of my goalkeepers, I didn't even know, but he's a, he's a musician and every single presentation that he put together, he designed own, his own soundtrack for it. I wouldn't have known that. All of a sudden, not only is he putting together uh, set piece clips and his brain activity clips and he's giving feedback, he's having you know, compassionate music when he's giving negative feedback, he's having upbeat music when he's giving positive. Just, it's amazing by just saying think outside the box um, that these guys have had the opportunity to do so. Uh, and something for me as a, as a coach that, you know, it's a silver lining of this, this whole experience. And then just for, because of that, their ability to express themselves um, has been more obvious, you know. They've, I kind of know by body language, knowing that when I was giving Rob some feedback, Rob didn't take it personally, but when he was giving me, I did. Okay, so now I know that. So now all of a sudden, for me as a coach, I'm looking at their expression, um, and it's more obvious for me from a teaching tool but I think the relationship, they, they, know each, they know each other better to know that if someone's having a good day or someone's struggling with a situation, they've kind of understood some, some personality and some, and some kind of body cues that they, they might not have known or developed prior to this. So just, just some kind of key takeaways uh, from the whole situation, just to kind of provide the kind of project summary for the coaches, and, and I, can, I can share some of this information, no problem, but uh, goalkeepers past and present, week one, brain activity and brain training, week two, the importance of feedback and receiving feedback and giving and how to communicate that feedback, uh, the combined club call, which is just creating that connection with the club that we already have, but just strengthening it, and then obviously a set piece analysis through the eyes of a goalkeeper. <clears throat> just wanted to provide some resources too, um, so we talked about the, there wasn't any physical components. So we've done um, some at home with the pros workouts, workouts that I've done and I designed. And then I've, I've had uh, uh, Matt Turner, Jeff Caldwell, Joe Rice, some of our professional goalkeepers do these workouts too. So this is resources that any of your goalkeepers can, can absolutely utilize to, to do some stuff at home. I'm more than happy to talk about, you know, the points of emphasis on that and what we feel is important to do during this time at home. We can certainly discuss that. Um, but then I also wanted to put down a few podcasts that I, that I find really beneficial from a goalkeeper specific standpoint. And then knowing that not everybody is up to date with modern technology, that will be me too. I like to read a book, uh, some, some of the books that I've got that are specific to goalkeeping too. So just some contextual resources for you to have as coaches and, and we can share this information as part of the presentation. And listen, I'm more than happy to, to answer questions. I want this to be an open dialogue, whether you agreed or disagreed, that's totally fine. Uh, I've got an open mind. I want to I want to grow as a coach from this experience too. So I'd, I'd certainly love to, to to kind of assist and answer any questions that you have. Right, great stuff. Uh, if you want to turn the screen share off, and then we'll jump into some Q and A. We've got a few from the chat box, and uh, a lot of them are actually very similar to the ones that were provided ahead of time for us. Um, so as you're going through um, that, Scott Moroni um, asked prior to this, what is a skill deficiency you see in younger players coming into your system at the Revs that may be addressable in their youth experiences? Is my screen share off, Rob? Uh, no, it's still up at the moment. It's still on? If, if, yeah, if you click the little screen share button within blue jeans, it will turn off. There you go, shutting oh, down now. Perfect. Um, skill deficiencies. <clears throat> so for me, um, one of the things that I that I see a lot um, are goalkeepers when they come into our environment have 
a really good technical understanding of you know the ability to make saves with their hands, but then no real kind of ability and understanding of what the importance of a goalkeeper with the ball at their feet, or vice versa. And I think coming from that is twofold. People are being forced to play the position solely too early um, in, in some of the games. But I also feel that players are kind of being pushed away from understanding the importance of being a multi-sport athlete um, and how different sports, and I'll relate some to, to, to goalkeepers, tennis, badminton, racquetball, how though just three simple sports like that, that you're probably not going to play at school, or you're probably not going to play competitively, but how these sports can strengthen the profile of a goalkeeper. So I think in, in, in self-reflection, when I first started coaching, 15, 16 years ago, I was probably, I coached the heck out of technique. Goalkeeper's hands here, hands here, elbows here, catch this, move your feet that way. And then when it went to a game, I'm like, well, why didn't he come out for that ball? Well, why didn't he move across his goal that way and make that save? Because it looks doesn't look like that when I'm doing my technical sessions, when I'm in, when I'm in the training environment. So now it's kind of getting away from just coaching the heck out of technique and then just making sure that these guys and, and, and me as a coach understand the importance of being effective in your movements. Okay, so for me, it's you've either got a good, I see them all the time, the younger guys, really good technical understanding, but no kind of tactical understanding of the game or no kind of a understanding of what an effective action is because it's like, I've got to catch like this way, I've got to move this way and it's very robotic or tons of personality with the feet, but they've got no real understanding of how to, how to defend the goal via making saves. So um, that would be, you know, the, the two biggest things we can say, but as a coach now, it's I'm less about technique, 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 and more about whatever they're doing. Is it effective? Good Thank question. A couple more questions, a very linked question we had before and in the chat box from Matt. Uh, what age should a kid begin to specialize as a goalkeeper or play full-time as a goalkeeper if they want to? So I think two, uh, two full question, what, what age do they want to play if they want to, when they want to, right? Like, I think there's a big difference between a goalkeeper choosing the position and the position choosing the goalkeeper, right? So mm -hmm. as a goalkeeper, like I, my dad was a goalkeeper. He never pushed me. He never told me I had to do this, but he he wanted me to just to enjoy what I do. So I love being a goalkeeper. So I chose to be a goalkeeper at 11 years old, and I just never went away from it. I would say personally, around about that 12, 13 age group is when you should start to kind of specify a little more. Um, you know, it, it obviously at, at an MLS level, when you get to kind of 13, 14, you're, you're in it and just the demands of training and com competing at that level doesn't really lend itself to to other sports. Um, but I, I mean, for me personally, it's it's no no younger to just, just playing soccer and being a goalkeeper, no, no kind of younger than 13, you know, 12, 13. But I think the, the, the double-edged sword of that question is if a young athlete, really wants to do something like who are you as a coach to tell them that they can't you know as long as you provide other options and they understand that but if they really want to kind of navigate themselves towards that then that's who are you to tell anybody not that they don't want to do something if it's if it's not going to harm anyone you know but that's my own personal take on it appreciate that um another question that came in prior to is how do you excite young players to play in the goalkeeper position? Good question, right? Because I'm, I'm sure we've all been involved in programs where it's like pulling teeth trying to get someone to go and go on a Saturday, right? And I think the, 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 the way that a coach delivers the message, I think, is vitally important too. Hey, guys, who wants to go and go? they really important game, okay? Hey, tell you what, this is the most important position on the field because if you, if you don't let any goals in, we can, we can really do something as a team. Oh, okay, wow. Guys, who wants to be in goal today? Like, I know which one I'll respond to, right? So the messaging of how you can get at it is really important. Just the, the basic of the messaging is, is, is key. But I also think that it just goes back to that trust, the relationship that you as a coach have with the athlete that you're working around, and that if that trust is really important, is strong, that message, the connection is strong, that, you know, them players will want to do things for you, right? And I think if the relationship with the coach is strong and the connection is strong, all right, guys, like, who, 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 such, such, such and such, such and such, such and such, you guys, goalkeepers, who wants to do this today? 
and you know if you're kind of putting it back on them and you're empowering them to make the decision the messaging is important the trust and the relationship between the coach is really important um just like anything it's like when you're dealing with someone who you can see this person has got a ton of ability but then maybe he's not giving it their all on a, on a, on a practice or a, a game like how do you how do you work towards that as a coach it's the relationship it's the connection between you it's the messaging in which you deliver it but for me, they're the, they're the most important parts. And if you, if you deliver the messaging the right way and you have that trust and the connection with the athletes, you'll, you'll have more people wanting to do it to help the group out than more people navigating away because, you know, they feel it's just a negative connotation. And listen, it's, it might be biased, but it's the most important position on the field. You can have a striker and you can win a game 5-4, but if a goalkeeper doesn't let a goal in, you can't get beat. Right? So... Like, pardon to be blunt, but it's like that's that's like when you get there, like understanding that that kind of importance on the position. I know I know I'm joking, and I see some coaches laughing as I as I say that, right? But that that's fine too. But listen, it's the, it's the messaging in which you want them to to get out there and do it, and the messaging and the importance you put on the position. I think that really has a nothing but a positive impact on on getting people to play the position. Completely agree. Completely agree there. I appreciate that. Um, so one more question, then we'll open up 20 in the chat box if we get any more, because we're nearing the uh, the 7:30 deadline. Um, how do you help increase confidence uh, for a goalkeeper that stays rooted on their line or in their box and doesn't want to come out? Yeah. So it's so the the goalkeeper who who stays rooted on their line, and it and it might just be a, a personality trait, right? And and it's real. Some things you can teach and some things you can't, right? Um, goalkeepers will will ask questions to the coaches in many, many different ways, okay? And it won't just be, you know, where do I stand if the ball is here, all right? They might ask it, you know, away from the field. They might ask it, you know, on the way to a game. And as coaches, if you're not really kind of in tune with what these kids are asking you, you might miss that moment to really have an impact in teaching them. So for me, there's, there's a couple of things. When you talk about the, the, the vocal goalkeepers, okay, sometimes they don't know what to say. So base part is I say, say what you see, right? That's, that's what I teach all the goalkeepers, and it's the real simplest part of it is just say what you see. And I try and give them in three words, a name, what the attacker is doing, and where, right? So I might be talking to you. I don't know what to see, so you can be, okay, Carl, I want you to say what you see. Okay, so when I'm going through, the further I am away, f away from the ball, right, the harder it is for me to say and the harder it is for my teammate to hear me say. So I always try and give the goalkeepers one thing is try and get as close to the player as possible so that if you have to talk, they can hear you. Get as close to the ball as possible in a safe environment that what you see, right, that what you see is accurate, right, because what you see from on your goal line what you see might be on the top of your box, no matter it's 9v9 or, or, or a kind of 11v11 field, the picture will be different. And then saying what you see is, okay, I'm going to talk to Rob, okay? The attacker is on your right side, okay? And I want you to go away from goal. So it might be just Rob, right side, away from goal, right? Or Rob, right side, show him inside. So it's there, there, there are three things is what I want to talk about and as I really break the communication down and then I build upon that. It's they, they, they might not just not talk, not because they don't want to talk, because they don't know what to say, okay? And then that starting position might have a direct impact on what they see and the level and the confidence and the accuracy in which they're delivering that message. So kind of looped a, looped a couple of different topics in there for that one, but I think it's if you're kind of breaking it down, trying to keep it simple as possible for the goalkeeper. And then I, al I always build it around the communication part because if the communication is being said from back there, what they're saying is null and void. So try and get as close to the ball or the people that you're talking to as possible. So that, and then, the, and listen, here's the personality, Rob, right, is I need goalkeepers who are willing to insert themselves into moments, right? And now if you're willing to insert yourself into a moment as opposed to kind of remove yourself from harm's way, like that's something that I can reference that's something I can reproduce and try and teach, but that's can't something that I can make stick to the athlete. 
that's a trait that I think as a goalkeeper, you either really have it or you don't. So everyone talks about where you can't teach height, can't teach instinct and bravery in that moment. You know what I mean? You either want to be in there to make a difference or I want to be out there having no part of what's coming at me. And that's where you see, does the player choose the position or does the position choose the player? And sometimes by identifying that trait, you kind of have an emphasis to move forward and, and maybe you might have selected your goalkeeper without even knowing it just by their personality. Love it. A uh, question from Scott Maroney. How do you balance a player with a uh, hunger to work, work, work technically, physically and tactically without uh, the mental burnout? Good question, Scott. Good question. I, I, not to repeat myself, right, but the trust, I think trust is important. So um, likewise, you're trying to get a player to work hard. But if a player works too hard, that trust in you when you go, hey, Scott, you're really working your tail off, man. Just How about we just take a day? Yeah? How about you just go and play the field or you just, just take a day off today? Like that message to the person who's not working hard enough, if that trust is there, that'll, okay, well, Coach Scott's actually, it's always been good to me. He always tends to ha try and put me in the right environment. Does never really pressures me too much. He's telling me I need to work a little harder. Wow, I hate letting him down. Likewise, Wow, well, Coach Scott's always been good to me. He's never tried to push me. He's telling me I need to take a day off. Hey, Mom, I think I'm going to take a day off today, Mom. Coach Scott said I've been working really hard. And how about we just, you know, encourage him to go and get ice cream or whatever, you know, like just something different. But I think the message of the coach, the relationship, the connection that you have, the trust that you have with the individual, that's the, the nucleus to, you know, really whatever avenue you want to go down, whether it be physical, technical, technical, involvement, lack of involvement, the trust that you have with a player can really help you get what you want to get out of that kind of environment at that moment. So for me, I don't want to repeat myself, but I feel it's it's something that the environment and the trust is is imperative. And I hope that kind of answers your question, Scott. Right. Thank you. Seeing you. Yeah, I'm sorry. I think it's great that you repeated yourself. Um, so, Sprati, thank you very much. We greatly appreciate um, your time and your expertise. This has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, we will be sharing the video of this um, and hopefully presentation on our website as well. Uh, before we leave, there was a couple of um, requests for where they can find out more about Brain Games. Yeah. Um, so if you're able to help us and point us in the right direction for that, that would be great. But otherwise, uh, I'm sure everybody that attended will echo my sentiments that that was a fantastic presentation and uh, learned an awful lot from it. So thank you. Yeah, no, listen. Um, to the brain games when you it's uh, so if you type in if you can just go you can just go to to YouTube. If you type in uh, brain training and brain activity training, I think that's the the correct kind of um, verbiage that when you, you you'll type it in, uh, videos will come up. If you excuse me, if you type in brain training and DFB. You know the German Football Federation. Uh, they've got a, a bunch of uh, clips and, and resources on YouTube that they've they've taken imagery of. Um, and, and listen, I'm more than happy. And I see I see some other coaches that I know. I know Utah's on here for our our USL goalkeeper coach. I know that's something that you know since Utah came to the club, we've spoke a lot about and tried to involve into our sessions. And and I, like I'm more than happy to share that information too. So. On the last slide, I think I had my email address um, and I had my kind of my Twitter handle on there, and that's what I really kind of use. And I, I sometimes post a lot of stuff out there just to because now is the time when we should be sharing. Um, and 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 the last thing, Robin, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll wrap it up. But just for coaches out there, like there's there's no secrets here, right? In this time, like as a coach, you've got to be willing to share the information. Because another characteristic of the coach is you have to have that innate self belief to know that if I'm getting, if I'm willing to share, like, or if I'm getting information that someone shared, like, I want to be able to do better than them. I don't want to copy them. But just like an athlete, you want an athlete to always be better. As a coach, you've got to want to be better too, right? So be willing to share, knowing that you want people to share. And then as a coach, that innate self belief kicks in and goes, okay, this is really good information. I want to make my own tweaks. I want to do better than that person. I think as a coach, you know, you've played and you've always got that little competitive kind of seed in you. And I think that doesn't stop as the coach. So nothing's nothing's hidden. I'm, I'm more than happy to kind of share any of the information that I've given today. Um, but yeah, appreciate everyone for tuning in. Thanks, Rob, Matthew, Soccer, Mike, Loy, Tommy, Ian, Tammy, the guys who are on here. 
I appreciate you having me and kind of giving this platform for the coaches. Hope it helped.